subcommittee will come to order. This is a hearing on investing in the future of the federal workforce, paid uh, parental leave to improve recruitment and retention. I want to welcome Vice Chair Maloney, Ranking Member Marchant, members of the subcommittee and members of the Joint Economic Committee, hearing witnesses and all of those in attendance. I welcome you to the Federal Workforce Postal Service in the District of Columbia Subcommittee and Joint Economic Committee hearing on investing in the future of the federal workforce, paid parental leave improves recruitment and retention. The purpose of the hearing is to examine the merits of the Federal Employees Paid Parental Leave Act of 2007, H.R. 3799, which provides that all federal employees receive eight weeks of full pay and benefits for a leave taken for the birth or adoption of a child. Hearing no objection, the chair, vice chair, ranking member, and subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. I will begin with mine. Members of the subcommittee, members of the Joint Economic Committee, especially Vice Chair Carolyn Maloney, and hearing witnesses, welcome to the subcommittee's joint hearing on paid parental leave for federal employees. Today's hearing will examine the merits of H.R. 3799, Federal Employees Paid Parental Leave Act of 2007. The act introduced by Vice Chair Carolyn Maloney. The act provides that all federal employees receive eight weeks of full pay and benefits for leave taken for the birth or adoption of a child. The issue of parental leave is an important one, and I'm pleased to be a co-sponsor of this legislation. The United States is far behind the world in offering paid leave for parents. 168 countries offer guaranteed paid leave to women in connection with childbirth. 98 of these countries offer 14 or more weeks paid leave. The United States guarantees no paid leave for mothers in any segment of the workforce. The Family Medical Leave Act enacted in 1993 added 12 weeks of job protected leave for the birth or adoption of a child. While this unpaid leave has helped millions of families, many employees have been unable to take time off to care for a new child or a seriously ill loved one because they cannot afford the lost pay. H.R. 3799 remedies this problem for federal employees and will bring the United States in line with the rest of the world. The United States is supposed to be a world leader. and this area, we have been followers. It is time for us to catch up and provide paid family leave for federal employees. During the markup of H.R. 3799, I will offer an amendment that directs um, the Government Accountability Office to study the feasibility of providing a disability insurance benefit to federal employees. The disability insurance benefit, excluding paternal leave, would include paid time off for federal employees caring for a spouse, child, or parent that has a serious health condition and cannot care for themselves and or a federal employee that has a serious health condition that renders him or her unable to perform their job function. GAO would also analyze disability insurance benefits that are currently being offered by states, local governments, and the private sector. Today I will introduce legislation that will extend the maximum age qualify for coverage for dependents under the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program from age 22 to age 25. Young adults are the fastest growing age group among the uninsured. While the current law provides health insurance unto age 22, studies show, such as the one done by the Commonwealth Edison Fund, which is an organization that aims to promote a high-performing health care system in the United States, 
found that college educated or not, 22 year olds face waiting periods, temporary positions, and lower wage jobs as they enter the job market. Health care is not available to them at a price they can afford. Several states have enacted new legislation to avert this health crisis. Providing federal employees with paid parental leave and raising the maximum age to qualify for the FEHBP from 22 to 25 will increase worker morale and improve productivity by creating a more family-friendly environment for federal employees. I thank all of you for being here today and look forward to the witness testimonies. And I now yield to the uh, Vice Chair of the Joint Economic Committee, Ms. Maloney. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Chairman Davis, for holding this hearing on this incredibly important uh, issue. And Ranking Member, we thank you. I, uh, Danny and I have a long history of successes. Uh, first, with the census, we worked uh, hand in glove to get a more accurate count. And later, with the postal bill that took us maybe 10 years to pass, it just, was, just never seemed to get uh, done. But we did get a balanced and fair bill passed. And, and I hope that our, uh, our success will be uh, a winning streak on this and we'll be able to report this out of the committee and, and pass it and get this important uh, issue into the lives of federal employees and their families. I do want to thank the witnesses for being here to testify today. And uh, very clearly, I know all of us understand that the American workplace has not kept pace with the changing needs of workers and families. Both uh, Ozzie and Harriet go to work now. So most families no longer have a stay-at-home parent to care for a new child, and they can't afford to forego pay for any length of time. Experts in child development tell us that mothers need time to recover from childbirth and that mothers and fathers alike need time to care for, for and bond with their new baby. All Americans have the right to job-protected leave under the Family and Medical Leave Act. And I must say that was the first bill I voted for in 1993 when I came here as a new member of Congress. Yet very little since then has passed to help parents balance work and family. And for a country that talks about family values, we should be doing more uh, to help our hardworking men and women. I just uh, feel very strongly about this. Uh, when my first child was, uh, I was expecting my first child, I was working for the state of New York and I called them up and I asked them about their leave policies. And they told me, uh, this is a true story, they said, we don't have any leave policies, women just leave. And there was no consideration, no family and medical leave, you just left. And uh, she said, maybe you should apply for disability. Well, pregnancy is not disability, and I would never do that for pregnancy. But in any event, uh, many women have been afraid of losing their jobs and uh, because of doing uh, the wonderful thing of having a child. And the United States is very, very far behind the rest of the world. We are the only industrialized country that, not, that does not ensure paid family leave for all our workers. In fact, a, a recent report by the Government Accountability Office that I requested shows that the United States lags far behind other industrialized countries in providing policies that help families balance the competing demands of work and family responsibilities. You can go to my government website and get this entire report. The European Union requires that member countries offer a minimum of 14 weeks of paid maternity leave as a basic employment standard, but most countries offer more than the minimum. Federal workers, like many U.S. workers, do not have access to paid parental leave, so they are forced to choose between their paycheck and their new child. Federal employees who become new parents do have the option of using their accrued sick days and vacation time or tapping into a leave bank. This may work for the lucky families who never get sick, never need a vacation, and are happy to rely on the kindness of strangers. But as one of our witnesses will tell us this morning, even the best prepared workers face difficult choices when children need their care. As our country's largest employer, the federal government should be leading the way in providing a family-friendly work environment 
but it is not. The Joint Economic Committee released a report yesterday that I requested which shows that the federal government lags far behind Fortune 100 companies in providing paid family leave as part of their benefits package. You can read the report on my website, www.maloney.house.gov. Fortune 100 companies overwhelmingly offer mother's paid leave lasting six to eight weeks long. Yet the federal government has no family leave policy beyond family and medical leave. With only 319 days left of the Bush administration, the President's Office of Management and Personnel is here today to tell us only about their plan for a short-term disability. But this plan falls far short of being a paid family leave policy. The lack of paid family leave puts federal agencies at a disadvantage when competing for the best and the brightest employees. Our federal workforce is aging as agencies have found it difficult to recruit and retain younger workers. It's probably one of my children calling. Take it in the other room. Providing uh, paid parental leave would encourage younger workers who may be considering having a family to stay with the federal government. We need to keep these workers. If we as a country truly value families, then we need new policies and investments that support our working families and set out children on a path of success early in life. In the absence of a federal paid leave program, California and Washington have passed paid family leave laws. I'm told New Jersey just passed one. New York has a, a bill pending before their legislature. When we pass H.R. 3799, over 2.6 million workers in the United States will have the right to paid parental leave, and we will be setting a standard for the rest of the nation to follow. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your outstanding leadership and commitment to this really important issue to American families and federal workers. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Maloney. We will now go to the ranking member, Mr. Mark Chan. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I want to thank the chairman today for holding this hearing. If you visit any suburban soccer field in America today, parent after parent will tell you that trying to balance work responsibilities and family responsibilities is an ongoing battle. Obviously, this battle is most intense in the weeks right after the time a child is born or joins the family through adoption. So I come to today's hearing interested to hear how this suggested expansion of paid federal leave might be viewed by federal employees. Is there a call for increased paid family leave? Or are federal employees asking for other types of new coverage instead? How will this new increased benefit square against private sector benefits? It's important to make sure that federal jobs are as competitive and appealing as possible, but as good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars, we have to be strategic in the way we choose to improve the federal workspace. It should also be pointed out that we need to understand the stress such an expansion of benefits places on the employees required to fill in while fathers and mothers take this needed leave. It's important that we make choices here that balance the family's needs with the needs of the government and understand the direct and indirect cost involved before we proceed with a plan. Hopefully we can find a way to satisfy all of these varied interests in one legislative vehicle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Marchant. And uh, we will now hear from our witnesses. And let me introduce them. Uh, Mr. Dan Beard is the third chief administrative officer for the House of Representatives. Dr. Beard returned to the House of Representatives at the start of the 110th Congress after serving as a senior advisor for the consultant firm Booz Allen Hamilton Incorporated. Previously, he spent 10 years on the staff of the House Appropriations and Natural Resources Committee. His three decades of experience in policy affairs and management issues also include positions with the Senate White House, Interior Department, and the Library of Congress. Uh, thank you, Dr. Beard, for being here. Ms. Nancy Kitchak is the Associate Director for Strategic Human Resources Policy for the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. She leads the design, development, and implementation of innovative, flexible, merit-based human resources policy. Of course, it is, uh, 
policy that all witnesses be sworn in before this committee. So if you would stand and raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. The record will show that each witness answered in the affirmative. Of course, your entire statement is already included in the hearing record. The green light indicates that you have five minutes to summarize your statement. The yellow light means your time is running down. And of course, you have one minute remaining to complete your statement. And the red light means that your time has expired. Of course, we will make sure that the light uh, gets to working properly. <laughs> and I'm sure the technicians <laughs> will be here in a minute. But thank you very much, and uh, we will begin with you, Mr. Beard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Congresswoman Maloney, Congressman Michon, I thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today to discuss the importance of providing paid uh, parental leave for federal employees, including legislative or branch employees. I, I want to compliment you for introducing uh, H.R. 3799. This is an important bill, and it's my hope the bill can be enacted promptly. It is important to note that Section 3 of the bill uh, provides for eight weeks of paid family medical leave for legislative branch employees. Uh, I appreciate you including these employees um, because too often they are left from this type of, uh, left out of this type of legislation. As the officer who would be charged with implementing this legislation, I can assure you we will not have any problems implementing it. Uh, the legislation is written, and I hope that it will be enacted as soon as practical. Um, Mr. Chairman, this legislation will fill a significant gap in our employ employee benefits portfolio. The legislative branch, as well as the executive branch, is operating in a highly competitive job market. Uh, we must compete against other private sector, nonprofit, and government organizations to attract a talented and diverse workforce. Since it is difficult to compete based solely on salary, uh, it is even more vital that we have a strong employee benefit package to present prospective employees. In addition, having a strong pay and benefit package is absolutely essential to retaining the workforce that we currently have. It is naive to think that we can attract and retain a first class workforce without strong pay and benefit packages. And that's why H.R. 3799 is so vitally important. You know, one of the great myths about the federal workforce is that they're benefit rich. And I think this myth is, uh, this, the myth is that federal, the federal workforce is underworked overpaid and wallowing in cushy benefits, and I just think this is absolutely false based on my 35-year experience. Federal employees may have had great, benefit, uh, great benefits and a great benefit package in the 1950s, but that certainly isn't the case today. Last fall, I hired the consulting firm of Watson Wyatt to compare the benefits received by employees of the House of Representatives against employees of 14 other private firms hospitals, universities, and state governments. And I've included two charts uh, with my testimony that identify the firms and organizations that we compared them, uh, that we were compared against. As you can see from the second table, our defined benefits retirement pro program and our retirement, our retiree life insurance programs are ranked first among the 15 organizations examined. However, in every other area, our benefit package did not measure up to our, comp to our competitors. We have a long way to go before the benefit package of our workforce is competitive for purposes of attracting and retaining employees. There is one other myth I want to raise with respect to paid family and medical leave benefits. As as major uh, criticisms, uh, one of the major criticisms that's used to oppose this benefit is that it costs too much money. I just don't think this is the right way to look at it. Salary budgets for federal employees remain the same whether the employee takes leave or not. The salary for that employee has already been included in a budget, and whether the employee is on paid leave or uh, not doesn't really affect the budget of the employing authority. 
it is also incorrect to assume that if an employee takes family or medical leave or parental leave the employee must automatically be replaced by a paid replacement worker the question of whether you need to replace an employee for up to twelve weeks is a management decision based on the particular characteristics of the organization in fact in most cases careful management of human resources which includes the effective absorption of the on leave employees workload by other staff can minimize or eliminate the cost of providing such FMLA benefits it would even I would even argue that such a benefit saves money in the long term because employee morale is always greater when an employer treats their employees with dignity and especially in times of crisis Mr. Chairman I want to thank you again for the opportunity to be here with you today and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have thank you Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittees thank you for inviting me here today to discuss parental leave we share your interest in in this topic and ensuring that the federal government has programs to assist employees in balancing their work and personal needs today's hearing is focused specifically on HR 3799 the federal employees paid parental leave act of 2007 HR 3799 would provide eight weeks of paid leave in addition to the employees accrued annual or sick leave that could be substituted for any portion of the 12 weeks of Family Medical Leave Act leave employees would not be required to use their accumulated annual leave and sick leave before using the eight weeks of paid leave results from the federal human capital survey show federal employees are very satisfied with benefits including paid leave for personal and family illness very few employers provide for unlimited accumulation of sick leave by the employees but that is what we do in the federal government full-time employees covered by our leave system earn 13 days of paid sick leave each year any amount they do not use by the end of each year accumulates and remains available for their use in future years Federal employees may use up to 12 weeks of accrued sick leave in a year to care for a family member with a serious health condition. Pregnancy and childbirth are included in the definition of serious health condition for this purpose. An employee can use this leave to accompany the expectant mother to prenatal appointments, to be with her during her period of hospitalization, and to care for her during her recovery from childbirth. The FMLA provides 12 weeks of unpaid leave within 12 months of the birth or adoption of a child. Federal employees may substitute any accumulated annual leave for unpaid leave. Sick leave may also be substituted for periods such as the mother's recovery from childbirth and for routine medical or well baby appointments. The federal government also has advanced leave, leave banks, and leave sharing programs to assist our employees needing more help. Even with all these benefits and flexibilities, we recognize there is one missing piece we need in order to have a truly complete package of quality benefits. That missing piece is income support for employees who experience short-term disabilities, including as a result of childbirth, early in their careers or when they have been unable to accumulate sufficient sick or annual leave to meet their needs. We appreciate that HR 3799 recognizes this gap and proposes a solution with respect to parental leave. We believe, however, any solution should recognize there are other circumstances involving short-term disabilities in which an employee may need benefits beyond those already available. Accordingly, we are proposing to establish a new short-term disability insurance program for federal employees. It would offer employees an opportunity to purchase STDI coverage on a voluntary basis. It would be available at affordable premiums based on group rates that leverage the size of the federal population. 
The new STDI program would safeguard federal employees during their temporary inability to perform their jobs because of a non-work-related disability, including accidents, illnesses, or maternity. The more comprehensive nature of the program would make it more attractive to employees than the coverage under H.R. 3799. In addition, the short-term disability insurance would not adversely affect agencies' ability to budget for staffing requirements. We look forward to working with you to explore in more detail the best approach to meeting the needs of all our employees for income support during periods of absence due to parental responsibilities and temporary disability. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this issue, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Kichak. Um, we will now proceed with uh, questions of the witness. Uh, Mr. Beard, uh, again, let me thank you for your testimony. You stated that paid family leave would not affect the employing authority's bottom line. Could you further expound on this since OPM states that this type of plan would be too expensive? Well, uh, I can only relate the exp my, our experiences with the chief administrative officer's um, office. Uh, we, since 2002, we have averaged approximately 90 requests for FMLA each year. Uh, Thirty-six percent of those were for uh, parental or spousal um, health conditions, and forty-four percent were with uh, requests due to uh, medical leave associated with the individual, and only approximately twenty percent uh, were for parental leave. So um, we know we know the statistics on how many people are going to be out, uh, what the requests are. Um, and we know, you know, it, it's not an unknown to us in each year. Uh, so as we develop our budgets, we develop our budgets uh, with an eye to how many people do we anticipate will be out, approximately how many of those would we have to backfill for with temporary employees, and how many can we handle through job sharing or having other employees pick up those, um, um, pick up those, uh, their the jobs, uh, the functions or activities that an individual may carry out. So I, I just don't think it's an unknown factor. It's not like you suddenly run around or, or you're going along in a car and you go off a cliff. We know exactly what, we know what's going to happen each year. Uh, we can anticipate it. It's a management issue more than anything else. Frankly, I think, and I think the real positive here is, is that uh, too often we forget Family Medical Leave Act requests are requests at a time of crisis for an employee. I mean, these are not made routinely, uh, and you can't uh, get approval for them as if they were a routine sickness. This is a, a moment in an employee's life when something major is occurring. And we as an employer really have to make a, a, a decision that we want to try to help our employees in this time of crisis, or in the case of a parental leave, happiness, I guess, but, um, uh, you know, you, you really, y it, it, it behooves the management uh, of any organization to look at FMLA in a, in a positive way, that this is a point, this is a, a time, uh, this is a, an activity that you want to undertake at a time of crisis, and you want to help your employees, because you want to retain those employees, because if we lose employees, if we have a high turnover rate, it hurts the institution as a whole. Do you see any downside? I mean, you've, you've testified, obviously, in favor of, of the legislation. Do you see any downside to it at all? Well, I think the biggest downside in the House of Representatives is we have operated here historically under a concept that each member is a, a separate employing authority and can decide what it is they want to do. Uh, this legislation would uh, interject into that concept or philosophy by saying that there's a, there's a fundamental prerequisite here that at least you at least get eight weeks of paid FMLA. Right now, uh, it's all over the board. I do know of one office that provides 18 weeks of paid FMLA for parental 
purposes, and then I know of offices that don't provide any paid. Uh, so it's all over the board with the 440 member offices as well as approximately another uh, 50, no, more than that, about 100 offices that it would be employing authorities that would have uh, made a decision about that. So uh, I think, to me, that's the biggest problem. I don't think that it's a, it's a monetary one. Thank you. Ms. Kichak, did OPM work with employee groups in developing the short-term disability insurance program? Right now, the proposal that we've submitted is allows us to contract for a coverage. We haven't, we haven't fully designed it yet, so there's always opportunity for discussion. We're very mindful of letters that we receive from people telling us that they have a need for short-term disability early in their career. So the proposal was designed based in recognition of input we have received from employees. Currently, uh, federal employees can donate only annual leave to agency leave bank programs and not sick leave. Would you support a change in the law to allow a federal employee to donate unused sick leave in the same way that they can donate unused annual leave? As a new proposal, we would have to look at that and consider its consequences. That hasn't been proposed before, so I don't have a position on that. Uh, you state in your testimony that full-time employees covered by our leave system earn 13 days of paid sick leave each year. Any amount that they do not use by the end of each year accumulates and remains available for their use in future years without limitations. And I think that's great. What options, though, do new employees have who have not accrued any sick leave? Well, first of all, we have recognized that for new employees who haven't accrued sick leave, we have a gap in coverage, which is why we are proposing the short-term disability. But currently, Folks who have not accumulated leave have the option of the leave banks. They also have the option of advanced leave. We can grant up to 30 days of advanced sick leave in a year. We can also grant advanced annual leave for those folks. And then, of course, they have the right to request Family Medical Leave Act leave for serious health conditions, and that's 12 weeks. So there's, there are options today. We're just not saying there are as many options as we would like to have. We would like to have an additional option. Thank you very much. I'm going to now yield to Mr. Marchant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Beard, uh, just a couple of questions about uh, your interpretation of how this bill is written. Um, in the case of two parents and an adoption, which uh, would one parent choose to be the person taking the leave, or would both parents take the leave? I have no idea. I mean, I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Okay. I would have to work with the staff to figure out what the, what the right answer is. But certainly in an adoption um, or, or the birth of a child, um, both parents are, um, they're both parents and they both bond and build a relationship with that child over time. So I don't think it's necessarily so that you would have to, that the choice that a couple would have to make a gut-wrenching choice that only one parent would be able to stay home. So it doesn't seem to me to be fair. It would be your, would, it, would it be your recommendation and the, the bill would be written to where both parents would? Uh, it certainly would be my recommendation, but I'm just a simple administrator, Mr. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> but in your administrative <laughs> opinion, uh, when you when you made the statement that this has all been factored in and and there would be no significant impact, were you thinking that both parents would be taking off? And yeah, I we had a we had a couple who uh, had a two two people who worked for me uh, had a premature set of twins, which unfortunately died. Both, um, mem both uh, the couple was out for 
um, that a time period, uh, one of them came back earlier than the other. But I think in that, that traumatic experience, it was a, a, a terrible experience to have happen to your employee. Uh, and I think the employees of our organization, I was proud of the fact that they were more than willing to jump in and mm -hmm. to try to help it out in that particular instance. I don't think it would have been fair to say to those employees, well, one of you has to, you know, not get paid for this period of time. Yeah, I really, I mean, I, the question was not about the quality of the answer, but just the, how you quantify it okay. as far as the effect on, on a budget. And I think the other thing that I would personally be concerned about as far as our legislative staffs is, uh, and not so much our district staffs, but our staffs here, is um, um, the concern that I have, might have of my legislative director uh, in the middle of the session uh, had to avail themselves of this, and, and, it, and it, it actually, I think, it, I think your observation that this would this would significantly impact some of uh, the way we ran our offices would be, be something that, that I hadn't thought of. Yeah. Will the gentleman I, uh, yield for a point of information? The bill does not cover congressional offices. Okay, I, I often we are uh, we are in a different category, so it doesn't cover the, uh, congressional offices, but it covers those who look work for the legislature, the sergeant at arms, the legislative offices that work in the various agencies that interact with the legislature. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, I misunderstood what he said then. Um, I I think the. You know, the, the real difficulty here, in, and I think one of the great challenges in, with respect to the legislative branch is what kind of a, you know, we have to make a decision. What kind of employer do we want to be? Do we want to be a strong employer or do we want, a, want to be a springboard employer? Uh, we have a history here, in, in, at least in the legislative branch. Our employees come in for a few years and then they, you know, they go out and they go downtown and they make a lot more money. And every day they pick up the paper and they're flooded with ads of, well, here's a good ad. I, you know, in one sense, we're in a competitive environment. All the staff here are, they're hounded daily with, you know, gee, there's some good jobs here that make a lot more money than I do, a lot better benefit package. And just like the federal government is now holding, you know, going to job fairs trying to attract good employees, we have to re attract and retain good employees in the legislative branch because it's extremely expensive to, um, you know, train new work, or new workers uh, every, you know, if somebody leaves, if the general rule of thumb is a year to year and a half of salary is going to be the cost you'll be incurred for recruitment, training, and getting that employee back up to speed. Um, so it, it's an expensive process and it's one that we've grown to accept. Um. As far as the proposed uh, short-term disability plan, can you give me an idea of what uh, I think you, you, you say it would be inexpensive? Can you, can you quantify that $30, $40 a month? Is well, the uh, legislation we've proposed does not have the actual benefit design in it to allow us to negotiate the best deal when we procure this. But we have estimated for a uh, program that covers 12 weeks at 60 percent that the premium would be a thousand dollars a year which would be less than forty dollars a pay period for federal employees okay thank you mr. chairman thank you much uh, mark chant uh, miss Maloney first of all I'd like to thank both of the panelists and thank you for your support of the legislation and uh, I'm really thrilled with that and I'd like to ask uh, both of you the federal government has uh, never been able to compete with private industry with regard to wages. Um, so uh, one of the selling points for federal employment is focused on the benefits we offer. One point you both agree on is that the federal government is missing an important piece in its benefits package and that it, it is some kind of uh, income support for parental leave. Uh, but you seem to have different views of how best to provide such benefits. And I'd like to ask each of you, how do you each see the lack of paid family medical leave type leave affecting our competitiveness with other sectors, meaning the federal government's competitiveness? 
think, okay, I'll, I'll go first. We definitely have heard as we go out recruiting and through letters to our office that having a some income support for folks during the maternity period is an important recruitment tool. And that's why we have uh, included the short-term disability, but we definitely hear it's needed for recruitment. Okay. Uh, can you each discuss how HR 3799 would affect the federal government's ability to recruit and retain workers? Well, I'll, I'll jump in this time. I think one of the things that you, n you need to look at your workforce, and in our particular case, the 10,000 employees of the House of Representatives, 40% of those employees are under age 30, and um, another 14% are between yeah. 31 and, and 35. So uh, over half of our workforce uh, is under 35 years of age, and that's a time in your life when um, uh, having children I is a ma major part of your life. Um, and as a result, this kind of benefit uh, I th it would be uh, very attractive and very helpful for us to keep and retain our employees. Uh, that's the other reason that I, I had Watson Wyatt look at the benefit package that we offer and try to compare it against the private and nonprofit sectors. It's not a perfect study. Uh, and the benefits vary widely within the House of Representatives, but the important point is we at least have some indication of where we're weak, and this is one area where we are weak, and this bill would correct that weakness. Well, Ms. Kishak, if I could ask you as a follow-up, as employees retire, uh, the loss of experienced workers uh, could have adverse effects on productivity and economic growth. What specific um, activities has OPM suggested that agencies implement to address the need to recruit and retain our valuable workers? Uh, we're working very hard with our agency, with the agencies throughout the federal government to help them develop programs uh, for retention. We have a lot of flexibilities. We have uh, retention incentives that could be used for pay. Uh, we also have uh, succession planning activities that get us to work with folks so that if we aren't able to retain them and they leave, we have plans in place uh, to, to transfer that expertise. We also have to recruit folks uh, a very good benefit package, even with this gap that we admit is there. Uh, Watson Wyatt's study shows that our pension plans are very good. As I said before, the Federal Human Capital Survey of our employees, we had 86% satisfaction with our, our leave programs for illnesses. So uh, we're working on some pay programs to peop keep people, some succession planning, and then we're also looking at the recruiting area and what we need there. Well, I, I was uh, struck, Dr. Beard, by the testimony that you provided uh, that paid leave would not have an impact on salary budgets, uh, that uh, careful management could minimize or the need uh, for temporary help, therefore actually saving taxpayers' dollars. Uh, so it seems to me that uh, paid parental leave is a good investment in our valuable workforce and could save taxpayers' dollars in the long, in the long run. Would you agree, Mr. Beard? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we're, we have to be a good employer. Um, we've all heard stories of, of valuable employees who leave this institution because they can make more money and get a, you know, they get a better deal someplace else. Uh, and the information and knowledge that they have here is critical. Um, and somebody is willing to pay a lot of money for it and provide a lot of benefits. But the institution loses, uh, no matter who leaves. Uh, and I think it behooves us to provide the best benefit package we possibly can so that employees can make this a profession and that we keep and retain good employees. And if our management is good, if we are careful and thorough and we anticipate problems that are coming, uh, we can work our ways through that. And, and I think in the long run, it has this tremendous benefit uh, to the institution. Thank you so much. And, and Barry, could I ask one last question to Ms. Kieshak? Does OMP, OPM, um, 
is your short term disability your paid leave policy and are you developing a paid leave policy or planning to implement implement one before the end of this administration our short term disability is our our proposal to deal with this gap and so we're not this is the only proposal we're working on in that area okay. we're working on lots of other things though to retain employees we also have a a reemployed annuitant bill to try to, in the event that we're not able to retain folks, to allow our an annuitants to come back on a part time basis and help us. So, um, those are the, the two big things for us is we are concerned about the short term disability and, of course, our reemployed annuitants. Thank you both very much. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Maloney. Uh, Mr. Sarbane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, I want to salute Congressman Maloney for this, this important legislation. <coughs> I was looking at the chart that you had at the end of your testimony, um, and Dr. Beard, and I, I was, I guess it doesn't appear there, there isn't a category on paid um, parental leave because it's not, doesn't currently exist, is that right? No, it wasn't included in this one. Okay. Um, do you have a sense of how, um, I mean, how dominant that offering is in the private sector? I don't. I could answer for the record, but I would say that in our case, um, I mentioned earlier that approximately 80 percent of the use of FMLA in the chief administrative officer's office is for medical reasons associated with either the individual or their parent uh, or spouse, and only 20 percent is for uh, pregnancy or child-related uh, kinds of benefits. So it, it FM, paid FMLA is important not only for new parents, but it's also important for um, other employees for health reasons, mm -hmm. either their health or the health of their spouse or a parent. I have a sense that the, you know, different kinds of benefits are more or less eye-catching than others when people are considering where they should go work. And I think paid parental leave is one of these things that kind of will jump out at people. I in some ways, with the effect that uh, you might see it offered in some private sector arena It'll catch your eye. It'll be a motivator for you to go there. Uh, you may l look past um, unwittingly the fact that the rest of the benefits offered by that same employer actually are not all that great compared to, uh, for example, what the federal government could offer. But you're already kind of on your way with the psychology that this is a workplace that's sort of more responsive to your needs. And so, I mean, I, I'd be curious to have you comment on that because I could see where, I mean, there's, there's two benefits to this. Obviously, there's, there's the, the substantive benefit to the individual mm -hmm. of having this available to them and what that means for their family and their quality of life, and that is critically important, and it's a driver for this kind of legislation. But the other is getting back to this co uh, conversation we've been having about competition. And this is one of those to be crass, one of the kinds of benefits that's a real bell and whistle when people are making those comparisons. And we can have wonderful benefits available that stack up very well against all the other uh, lists of benefits that might be offered in another job. And if this one's not there, that could be the reason that somebody decides to take the other job and so we have a competitive disadvantage. So. Maybe you can talk about that just a little bit. Well, I, I could certainly jump in. I mean, as I, as I mentioned earlier, 40 percent of our workforce is 30 years of age or younger. The first thing that employee is going to look at is how much am I going to be paid. If we're reasonably competitive, then they're going to look beyond that. Probably the next thing they're going to look at is what kind of a contribution are we going to get to repayment of student loans, uh, if they have a student loan. And right now, we're capped at $6,000. We've requested money to increase that to $10,000 for next year, so we're on par with the executive branch. But the third item they're probably going to look at, especially if they're, uh, they're married, 
is going to be what kind of a parental leave policy do we have and probably what kind of a daycare or uh, you know uh, daycare arrangement do we have but uh, it's going to be in the first tier of benefits that they're going to look at if they're making that job decision and um, I, I think it's instructive uh, Newsweek carried a story this week on uh, the competition that the federal the executive branch is you know interviews with some of the employees that they're meeting with at these job fairs and salary is number one on their mind but they're also looking at benefit packages as well so. yeah our research shows that uh, 76 percent of companies and I think it's the same Watson Wyatt that you mm -hmm. use provide for the the uh, care during the childbirth time through the short-term disability packages so that's the vehicle they use we also do some research into which of our benefit programs are attractive in hiring and in the federal government and by the way we have an older workforce than he quoted we don't have 30 percent under 30 I don't have the exact number but but the executive branch is a little older uh, we find that the thrift plan that we have is is the most important thing to employees for recruitment and retention but we still believe we we need to have a gap in this area that's not to say just because we have a thrift plan we have everything we need we just know it's number one in people's view thank you thank you very much um, I don't have any further questions so I want to thank the witnesses unless someone else is speaking We'll thank the panel witnesses. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will proceed to our second panel, and uh, while they're being uh, set up, I'll just go ahead and uh, introduce them. Uh, Jane Walsfogel is a professor of social work and public affairs at Columbia University School of Social Work. She is also a research associate at the Center for Analysis of Social Exclusion at the London School of Economics. Dr. Walsfogel has written extensively on the impact of public policies on child and family well-being. We thank you for being here. Uh, Sharon Tajani is the Senior Policy Counsel at the National Partnership for Women and Families in its Work and Family Program. At the National Partnership, she works on all aspects of the Work and Family Program, including paid leave, paid sick days, and protecting and expanding the FMLA. Thank you for coming. And uh, Vicki Lovell is the Director of Employment and Work Life Programs at the Institute for Women's Policy Research in Washington, D.C. Dr. Lovell's work focuses on issues related to women's employment and economic security, including job quality, paid and unpaid time off policies, pay equity, work supports, and unemployment insurance. She has provided extensive technical assistance to national, state, and local policymakers on paid sick leave, sick days, and paid family and medical leave programs. We thank you for coming. It is the policy of this committee to swear in all witnesses. So if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will show that each of the witnesses answered uh, <coughs> in the affirmative. Uh, we're delighted that you're here. Of course, all of your statements are included in the record. We would ask that you summarize in five minutes, and we have this light to assist in knowing how the time is going. Green light means that you've got the full five. Yellow light means that you're down to one minute, and of course, the red light is asking that you would conclude. Uh, Dr. Walfogel, we'll begin with you. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
Chairman Davis, Vice Chair Maloney, uh, Ranking Member Martin, Congress Member Obama, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to testify today. Uh, the, you heard from the first panel about benefits of uh, extending uh, parental leave, paid parental leave in terms of employee productivity and retention. Uh, however, the main purpose of paid leave is to allow families time together when they need it. So I'd like to use my time today to talk about the effects of paid parental leave on child and family well-being. My testimony today will focus on three points. First, that research shows that parental leave is beneficial for children and parents. Second, the FMLA has increased leave coverage, but its effects on usage have been limited due to the leave not being paid. And third, providing paid leave as other countries do would improve child and family health and well-being. So point one, research shows that parental leave is beneficial for children and parents. Uh, research has shown that women who return to work later in the first year have better mental health, less depression. Uh, we also know that when paid leave periods are longer, infant mortality rates are lower. That's not the case with unpaid leave. It doesn't have the same protective effect because parents are less likely to take it. We also know that children whose mothers stay home longer in the first year of life receive more preventive health care and are more likely to be up to date on their immunizations. They're also more likely to be breastfed and they're breastfed for longer. We also know that when fathers take longer parental leaves, they're more involved in the care of their infants nine to 10 months later when we interview them again. Second, the FMLA has increased leave coverage, but its effects on parental leave taking have been limited due to the fact that the leave is not paid. The FMLA was a landmark piece of legislation and it had a dramatic impact on raising parental leave coverage in the United States, especially for men who were, who were less likely to have been covered before the law. But the impact of the law on parental leave usage has been less pronounced. And especially concerning is the fact that we find that leave laws have a larger effect on leave taking among high-income families than among low-income families, suggesting that families are income constrained. Surveys confirm this. They confirm that some parents don't take leave to which they're entitled under the FMLA because they can't afford it. Among parents reporting that they needed a leave but didn't take it, the most frequent reason was the inability to afford it. Others take leave but undergo finan financial hardship, falling into debt or turning to welfare for support. Among those who take unpaid leave, more than half report it was difficult to make ends meet. About half say they would have taken longer leave if additional pay had been available. Point three, providing paid leave as other countries do would improve child and family health and well-being. The evidence indicates that a substantial share of parents in the U.S. are not able to take the leave to which they're entitled under FMLA because they don't have the right to paid leave. If we consider how parental leave in the U.S. compares to the situation in other countries, the results are clear. American mothers go back to work much more quickly than mothers in other peer nations, in large part due to the lack of paid parental leave. The OECD countries, our peer countries, now provide an average of 18 months of childbirth-related leave, and much of that is paid. Our neighbor to the north, Canada, extended its leave coverage in 2002 and now offers a year of childbirth-related leave with 50 weeks of that leave paid from a social insurance fund. The UK also recently extended its leave provisions. It now provides a year of job-protected maternity leave to all new mothers with the first nine months paid from social insurance funds and a commitment to go to 12 months of paid leave in the next parliament. So in conclusion, let me thank you again for inviting me to testify today on this important piece of legislation. By providing new parents with eight weeks of fully paid leave, HR 3799 would be an important step in improving the health and well-being of both children and parents. Thank you again, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, and we'll go to Ms. Tijani. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and Madam Vice Chair. I'm here on behalf of our President, Deborah Ness, who regrets that she wasn't able to make it today. The National Partnership is a nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy group that promotes fairness in the workplace, access to quality health care, and policies that help workers meet their dual responsibilities of work and family. We lead a diverse coalition of 200 groups dedicated to protecting and expanding the Family and Medical Leave Act. When we're not protecting the Family Medical Leave Act from regulatory changes that could scale back its protections, 
We are working to expand it by securing paid and family and medical leave so that no worker has to choose between a paycheck and caring for a loved one or recovering from their own illness. We're very pleased to have the chance to testify in support of the Federal Employees Paid Parental Leave Act of 2007, which would give federal employees eight weeks of paid leave after the birth or adoption of a child. Its enactment would be an important step towards making family and medical leave a reality for many more workers. Nearly the entire world recognizes the importance of being able to take time off after the birth of a child. A major international study last year found that the United States is one of four countries, the others being Liberia, Papua New Guinea, and Swaziland, that do not provi provide any paid leave after childbirth. In fact, right now, the FMLA is the only federal statute that guarantees workers here time off after the birth or adoption of a child. It provides 12 weeks of unpaid leave. Unfortunately, two in five workers are not covered by the FMLA, and many more cannot afford to take FMLA leave because it is unpaid. We simply can and, do mu and must do much better for America's workers. The FMLA has been a huge help to millions of workers who have made because of the unpaid leave that it provides. But it's time to take the next step and offer paid family and medical leave. The Federal Employees Paid Parental Leave Act of 2007 will help a lot more workers afford the leave that they need. The bill covers nearly all federal workers and legislative employees and gives them eight weeks of full paid family leave. Many people assume that federal workers already have paid maternity leave and paid paternity leave, in part because people assume that the federal government would be a model employer in all respects. Sadly, in this instance, it is not true. This le so this legislation would not only tremendously help federal workers, but it would also create a model for the nation and show that gov showed the country that the government really does value families. The Federal Employees Parental Leave Act would make paid maternity and paternity leave a reality for a workforce that is very diverse racially, economically, and geographically. And it provides eight weeks of leave for both men and women, parity which we consider critically important to any leave program. It also contains parity for birth parents and adoptive parents, which is another important point of parity and basic fairness. The bill will do for federal workers what several states are currently doing for all the workers in those states. In 2004, California became the first state to offer wage replacement while workers are on all types of family leave. Its law has given more than 13 million California workers partial income replacement while caring for a new child or a seriously ill family member. Last May, Washington became the second state to offer a program, and in Washington's program, parents, mothers, and fathers get five weeks of leave after the birth or adoption of a new child. And there are active campaigns to make paid family and medical leave available to workers in New Jersey, New York, Illinois, and Oregon. And just this week, New Jersey Senate passed a bill that, will, that is very similar to California's bill, and hopefully that will go to the Assembly next week and will become the law there as well. I want to stress that the, family, the Federal Employees Parental Paid Leave Act is really only a start. The maternity and paternity leave it would provide is critical for new parents, but it will not come close to meeting all the caregiving needs that federal workers have, because they also need paid leave to recover from their own illnesses, to care for spouses and older children and parents. Nevertheless, the bill would be a significant step forward. Too often we give only lip service to the family values we claim to hold dear. Passing this act is a chance to show that lawmakers really do believe that caring for a new child is important and will support that. The National Partnership for Women and Families will do all we can do to see that this becomes a law soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and we will move to Dr. Loba. Thank you, Vice Chair Maloney, Chairman Davis. Thank you for providing me with an opportunity to testify on the importance of paid leave for the federal workforce. My written testimony discusses how state temporary disability insurance programs offer a model for paid parental and family care leave. As we've already heard about SPI this morning from Ms. Kitchak, I will focus my remarks instead on two questions. First, is paid parental and family care leave important for the federal workforce? And second, what are the likely benefits to the federal government of creating new paid time off programs? In regard to the first point, the experience of paid family leave in California is instructive. A comprehensive paid family leave insurance program was enacted in California in 2002 with benefits starting in 2004. Workers there have been receiving benefits under the new program for three and a half years to care for a seriously ill child, spouse, parent, or domestic partner 
or to bond with a minor child. The program is administered by California's Employment Development Department in conjunction with the pre-existing short-term disability insurance program. We heard from Dr. Waldfogel about the impact of mother's parental leave on infants' well-being. The majority of claims under California's paid family leave program are in for bonding with a new child. 69% are mother's claims and 18% have been from fathers. In California, a birth mother may take both pregnancy maternity disability under short-term disability and six weeks of bonding leave. But infants are not the only beneficiaries of paid family leave in California. Another 8% of leaves in that state are taken by women for family care, with the final 4% taken by men. Only a very small fraction of California's workers take family care leave in a given year, only 0.17% or about two of every 1,000 workers. But for those who need the leave, the time with their family can be absolutely critical. One fourth of those California workers cared for family members who had cancer. Another one eighth cared for family members with heart disease. About one third of the leaves were to care for workers' parents and another third were for their spouses. Paid leave allowed these workers to provide urgently needed care without also facing a financial crisis from lost earnings in situations that could affect any family at any time. We have some evidence of the benefits of paid maternity leave for employers and it is reasonable to expect that family care leave would have some similar effects in lowering costs of turnover, increasing productivity, and positioning the federal government to be more competitive in hiring top talent. Women who have paid maternity leave work later into their pregnancies than those with only unpaid leave, and they are more likely to return to employment following the birth of their child. Other benefits, such as paid sick leave and health insurance, also reduce voluntary turnover because workers whose health and family care needs are met by their current employer are less likely to think about changing jobs. Thus, a paid family care leave program will allow the federal government to retain valuable staff with job-specific skills. Retaining, <coughs> excuse me, retaining workers is a big cost saver for employers. If we look in detail at what's involved in replacing a worker, we can see how the costs can add up. Exit interviews, advertising and employment agency fees, background checks, drug tests, interviews, and training. And then there are more subtle impacts, such as lost productivity involved with having a vacant position, low productivity of a worker who plans to leave soon, and low productivity and mistakes while a new learner gets up to speed. One commonly cited rubric is that employers pay 25% of total annual compensation to fill a position. This is a very significant expense for employers who cannot hold on to their workers. Workers who have benefits they value may also be more productive. A study of family-friendly policies in working mother best companies found that those providing paid leave to care for sick family members are more profitable than companies that don't. It may be that these firms inspire greater work effort by providing higher overall compensation than might be available elsewhere in the labor market. Or in the case of family-friendly policies in particular, workers may simply be less anxious and distracted about their family care situation and better able to focus on their work. Employees may feel more loyal when their parenting needs are accommodated and put more effort into their work. In all these scenarios, the employer enjoys greater productivity. The federal government does not compete with the average American employer, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> for the average American worker. Because the federal workforce is highly skilled and highly educated, the federal government competes for the best workers. To build the most productive workforce, Federal employment should be compensated so as to attract and retain top talent that could choose lucrative work in the private sector. Pay time off could provide an important competitive advantage in this effort. Well, thank you very much and thank all three of you for your testimony. Uh, are coming up, one is already on and the other one is a five minute break. So we would have to recess for about no more than 15 minutes and we'll be back. Thank you so much.